Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa here on France 24. Here are the stories making headlines across the continent. Day two of anti-government protests in Nigeria sees the police fire rifle shots over the heads of protesters in Abuja. Amnesty International says security forces have killed 13 demonstrators since Thursday. A pipeline carrying oil from Niger to Benin under continued threat of attacks by armed rebels. The assaults risked hampering growth in Nigeria, where oil exports are crucial to the economy. And the Kigali Sini Junction Film Festival gets underway in the Rwandan capital. The event will include screenings of both international and local films in the hopes of fostering rich cultural exchange. We begin in Nigeria, where it's day two of nationwide protests against the rising cost of living in the country. The outcry has been violent, with demonstrators clashing with police. Amnesty International accuses security forces of killing 13 people in protests so far. While day two has seen a lower turnout than yesterday, where thousands took to the streets in cities across the country. The show of anger pushed authorities to enforce curfews across several northern states, including Kano and Borno. It comes as Nigeria battles its worst economic crisis in decades, with inflation hitting a 28-year high of 34%. Take a listen to what protesters have been saying. We saw policemen from nowhere with tear gas. They scared us away with tear gas, and there was even shooting on the air. So that, is why, that, that was why that scared everybody away, and everybody ran for their lives. The security um, outfit officers, they are manning everywhere. So, and I can tell you that there is so much of fear they are trying to instill in people's fear, in people's heart for coming out to a protest today. We requested that each group that we, that we protest has to come to the police and notify the police. No group has notified the police. The other said, protest inside the studio. We are not stopping anybody from protesting, but look at how they are blocking the express road. I'm outside to show my anger that Nigerian politicians, they are not managing our money very well. There, there is so much corruption in the system and things must get better. We are protesting against widespread hunger in the country, widespread inequality, poverty in the country. We are also, we are also protesting against issues around insecurity in the country because there's a lot of insecurity in the country. Let's go to Niger now because the country has seen a series of attacks on a pipeline designed to carry oil to Benin at the hands of armed rebels. The 2,000 kilometer long line, which was built with the help of a Chinese company, is now under threat at a time when Niger's crude oil exports are crucial to the country's growth. The violence is a further strain on relations between Niger and Benin. In June, Nigerian rebels from the Patriotic Liberation Front claimed responsibility for the sabotage of a pipeline carrying the country's crude oil exports to Semeport in Benin. They are demanding the release of former President Mohamed Bazou. He was ousted last July and militia groups that back him have recently ramped up attacks on the military and infrastructure. Communities are also feeling the pressure. In the days after the pipeline attack, we were scared. But now it's better, because the military authorities have taken different measures than what we're used to seeing. The sites are secured, and more troops are now deployed along the roads where the oil infrastructures are located. The damaged pipeline has since been fixed, but fears remain. Rebels have threatened to sabotage crucial highways linking a refinery in Zinder to an export station in Jao. Most locals are worried that political disputes and a struggle for control of natural resources could trigger more violence. I am very unhappy about the pipeline sabotage, and I hope it would not happen again. We pray to God that there will be no more acts like this because it hinders the country's development. Niger's fragile economy has also been undermined by a freeze in crude exports over a diplomatic standoff with Benin. Niamey had plans to send 90,000 barrels a day for its neighbor and onto the international market. Currently, we are seeing rampant inflation, delays in the export of raw materials due to the closure of borders. 
we are also facing a liquidity crisis and a deterioration of the banking sector's portfolio, not only in Niger, but across all states in the Sahel. However, earlier this year, Niger's military junta secured a $400 million advance on its future oil earnings from the Chinese company that runs the oil transport pipeline. The Kigali Sini Junction Film Festival is underway in the Rwandan capital. The second instalment of the event is set to showcase international and local films in the hopes of fostering a rich cultural exchange. This year, organisers are particularly focused on gathering professionals from the Great Lakes region and locals around African cinema in the capital. Clement de Roma reports. The Kigali Cine Junction Festival is turning the streets of Kigali into one a giant cinema. The second edition of this event is bringing together artists and professionals from the region, including Kenyans, Ugandans and Nigerians. Filmmakers and actors from the Rwandan diaspora are back home to meet the public since the screenings will mostly be held outdoors. The organizer's goal is to make cinema more accessible as Rwandans visit cinemas quite rarely. Uh, Lukman Ali, a uh, Ugandan filmmaker, believes Kigali has a huge potential for the art form. I actually feel like Kigali is probably going to be the cinema hub uh, for, the, uh, for the region in the coming years because I, I feel like the, 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 the speed at which everything is moving is quite, quite, quite big. You can even set up this event here. I don't think you'd be able to do this in Kampala, for example, but it feels like uh, there's a lot of support for the art community, which is a good thing, and I think that's what all of us need, like in uh, the whole East Africa, we need this kind of energy. The opening film was Banal and Adama by Franco, a Senegalese filmmaker, Ramata Tulaisi. Also on the program is Omen, a feature film by a Belgian Congolese writer, director Baloji, an award winner at Cannes. The uh, festival program focuses on the aesthetics and particularities of African cinema through uh, four days of screenings, but also discussions and workshops with uh, filmmakers. The uh, organizers say they want to transform regional cinema into a more popular art and also establish the country of a thousand hills and its capital, Kigali, as an essential meeting place for African filmmakers. Now, Africa's top sportsmen and women continue to show their athletic prowess at the Paris Olympics. While well, week one of the Games is wrapping up this Friday, let's cross over to speak to Belelo Thinta in Johannesburg. He's a sports journalist. It's great to see you again, Belelo. So swimming is wrapping up now and athletics is getting underway. But there's been a bit of controversy, hasn't there? Because Nigerian athletes favour Ofuli uh, didn't get to run in today's 100-metre sprint heats. Quite right. The 21-year-old Dynamo, who is Nigeria's 100-meter uh, champion, was uh, knocked out by poor, poor, poor bureaucracy on her country's part. The NOC, uh, the Nigerian Olympic Committee, failed to register her in time. Now, keep in mind, the disappointment is doubled and amplified because in Tokyo, it was the very same story because uh, the Nigerian NOC uh, didn't allow the athletes to test in time to meet the regulations of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. So it is the second Olympics in a row where she hasn't been able to run. She's 21 years old, and she is arguably the biggest female star in America right now at Louisiana State University, which is a big, big problem because if you look in the NFL, there are big stars that'll back their alumni. And this is a big problem for Nigeria and for Africa and the PR of what we're trying to do for our great athletes who work so hard to achieve the Olympic dream, a an absolute catastrophe. Yeah, it's, it's quite shocking that this has actually happened. And Belilo, is this just another example of bad governance in general when it comes to African athletes? I think there has been a sort of a rising tide of our, of our athletes, I speak on behalf of Africa, because um, from the Maghreb right down to the Sadiq region, athletes have been um, sort of migrating to the, to the global north, not because they don't want to run for their uh, beloved nations, but rather because the incentives which they are given, uh, both financial and also, of course, these are the most competitive human beings you may ever meet in the world, is that they are looked after, developed, and then obviously taken to the peak of their performance, uh, whether it be in the Americas or indeed Europe. And it's it's absolutely heartbreaking to see a genuine gem and a star like this being treated like this. And it is perpetuating an age-old problem. You know, um, part of our problem 
that we've had as Africa, and I, I speak as a South African, but it's happened with many of the NOC, or so, sort of the OCs that have gone across. Is sometimes the delegations are actually better and bigger. Um, the bureaucratic um, guys, there's more of them than the actual athletes, which, which is very, very troubling. And now these rumblings arise again, an, an absolute catastrophe in what is supposed to be Africa's time, right? When the athletics starts in week two, we know what time it is. Unfortunately, this has been marred uh, by this brilliant, brilliant young woman being denied a chance um, to, to participate. And I might add there that her PB of 1093 would have been enough to, to get her at least into the final. So we're not talking about somebody who would have just been there and nice to participate. We're talking about somebody who would have been in the final because remember, she's got a 10.93 um, personal best and she won in 11.06, of course, the African title earlier this year, the, the, the Nigerian title, excuse me. So she would have been in the final. That's an even bigger disaster because that's a medal opportunity for Nigeria. It's really a pity for favour of Philly there. Um, let's move on because the continent is losing one of its greatest swimmers of all time. Tatiana Smith has announced her retirement. At the ripe old age of 27, believe it or not, she has called it a day. It's, it might sound young, of course, uh, for you and I who walk around in the streets, but for um, a female swimmer in particular, the sports science has shown in around 28, 29, um, the women tend to retire. So this is, uh, and it has been her swan song. So we're talking about comfortably the greatest African swimmer of all time. But she's actually in another conversation for being the greatest breaststroke Olympic swimmer of all time because she is in very rarefied air along, um, along with uh, Kosuki Kadaji, who is the Japanese medalist, where they have four medals um, in terms of the breaststroke. Only those two women in the history of breaststroke have achieved that feat, uh, by the way, at the Olympics, men or women. So we're talking about the greatest breaststroke swimmer arguably of all time, wrapping things up. Uh, as a South African, uh, we couldn't be more proud of this gracious all-time champion, all-time Olympian in Tatiana Smith. And she leaves it behind now to, to, to the young Canadian um, Summer McIntosh, who seems to be the next flag bearer for swimming. To Tatiana, to her family, she can be extremely proud of what she's achieved. Yeah, she's definitely, the sport is definitely going to miss her, I have to say. Thank you so much, Belelo Tinta. He's a sports journalist in uh, Johannesburg. Thanks so much for that update and your insight. And thank you for watching. That's it for now, but do stay tuned. There's plenty more to come here on France 24.